Back in October, we plotted the journey of a Home Office chartered flight deporting asylum seekers from the UK to France. The operation cost tens of thousands of pounds, and as we discovered, the whole thing managed to deport just one person, Ishmael from Sudan. For evidence of a broken asylum system, it was monumental. Today, the Home Secretary also spoke again of a system in meltdown. How broken? This broken. The system is becoming overwhelmed. 109,000 claims are sitting in the asylum queue, 52,000 awaiting an initial asylum decision, almost three quarters of those waiting a year or more. 42,000 failed asylum seekers have not left the country, despite having their claim refused. So, how to fix it? One of the big changes announced today was that the way asylum seekers arrive in the country will have a bearing on how their claims are assessed and on what type of status they get. In other words, if you are one of the 60 plus people who arrived on small boats today via a safe country like France, you'll be penalised. For the first time, whether people enter the UK legally or illegally will have an impact on how their asylum claim progresses and on their status in the UK if that claim is successful. The Home Office said today that this would not contravene international law like the Refugee Convention. But no sooner had the Home Secretary commended her statement to the House than top immigration lawyers were warning it would lead to more legal wrangling, not less. That's what I find frustrating is that we, we, we all want a clear, efficient, fair asylum system, but the more sort of tweaking around the edges and introducing grey areas, unfortunately will just make things more problematic and, and inevitably lead to litigation, which we'll, we would all like to avoid. There are a raft of other proposals in today's announcement. An end to the use of hotels to accommodate asylum seekers, more emphasis on resettlement schemes, and more attempts to limit last minute legal challenges which was the reason there was only one person on the deportation flight we followed back in October. On that flight in October, there were a whole series of last minute legal challenges came in at the very last minute. Well, unfortunately, a lot of our clients can't access legal advice until very late in the day. This very notion of a broken asylum system is at its core uh, a cover for home office failures. The system is not overwhelmed, it's just ineffective. The Home Office has a problem when it comes to removing people from the country, and it's not just down to last minute challenges. They're actually managing to deport fewer people with no right left to remain than they did in the past. But also, post Brexit, Britain will need bilateral agreements with individual countries in order to return people who shouldn't be here. The upshot of this clogged up system is people like Mary from Kenya, awaiting appeal and stuck in the system now for three and a half years. As I've been waiting, I am not allowed to work, which, which, which is really a situation that makes me feel like very degraded because if I'm not allowed to work, then I'm not able to integrate to the community because I have to stay like confined inside the house all day with nothing to do. It's a really tough situation. So your whole life is sort of frozen during this period? Yes, the waiting has made my life feel like it's stranded and just stuck. Finally, to Ishmael, the single deportee on the flight in October, we spoke to him this morning. His asylum claim was rejected in France. He's looking for work now on the black market in Paris. Fallen off everyone's radar. Well, joining us now from our Westminster studio is Chris Philp, the Minister for Immigration, Compliance and Justice. Chris Philp, the Conservatives have been in power now for 11 years. If the asylum system is broken, why haven't you fixed it before now? Well, until just a few weeks ago, of course, we were in the common European asylum system, the so-called Dublin system. So now we've left that at the beginning of January. We have an opportunity to fundamentally relook at the system, which we are now taking today. In addition to that, the legal system has evolved over time with case law and so on, making the system difficult to operate and requiring fundamental reform. What we're trying to do, as the Home Secretary said, is end this situation where criminal gangs can smuggle people, for example, across the Channel. They're endangering lives, uh, the routes are illegal, and of course they're unnecessary because countries like France are perfectly safe with very well-functioning asylum systems. So we're determined to end this criminality 
and end the risk to life. We saw a young family drowning tragically in the channel in French waters in October, a family of five. The youngest was only 15 months old. We've got to stop the threat to life and we've got to stop the criminality which is organising these crossings. But do you accept, though, that over the years that the Conservatives have been in power, the Home Office has actually got worse at managing the system? So, for example, 10 years ago, there were almost 42,000 returns and removals. In 2019, that had fallen to just over 19,000. Yeah, well, as the Home Secretary uh, said very clearly today, the system is broken. We're seeing people being smuggled across the channel, which is completely unacceptable. And when it comes to removing people that you just mentioned, a uh, situation has now arisen where people can make repeated claims over a number of years. They can make one claim, that gets rejected. It might be an asylum claim. Then they make some different claim, a modern slavery claim. And then a bit later they might make a human rights claim. It just goes on and on and on. And what we want to do today is have a, an effective, efficient system where the claims are heard, of course, and there's a right of appeal as well, but they're done in one go. So you don't get this situation where people can make claim after claim after claim. People like for serious criminals have used this to avoid deportation. We think that's uh, wrong. We think it's unfair. It takes up capacity in the system, which um, people like the lady on your clip a second ago um, obviously need to have their claim heard more quickly. So that reform is a really fundamental thing. We want to make sure those who have uh, genuine claims, who have their case that needs to be heard, can be heard, rather than getting endlessly delayed by people who are abusing the system. So you, you were saying that you were inhibited by being part of the EU until recently. So have any failed applicants who crossed the channel been sent back since the UK left the EU? Has a single one been sent back? Well, we're in the process of uh, speaking to European countries to talk about a replacement system to the Dublin one that we were in until just a few weeks ago. So that process is... So is that a no to that question, so though? That process, well, we publish the immigration statistics every quarter, um, but that process of discussions uh, is underway. But has any failed applicant been sent back since the UK left the EU? Well, as I say, we're in discussions with European countries. Of course, we do return failed asylum seekers to their country. It is a no, origin. then, to that question. The, we do return failed asylum seekers I assume seekers you to know their... the answer. We return failed asylum seekers to their country of origin the whole, the whole time. Uh, but many of these reforms aren't, don't require... But not a... since the UK left the EU. They, well, we, we publish asylum statistics. I'm not going to preempt our official publications. Um, but we return asylum seekers to their country, failed asylum seekers to their country of origin the whole time. And many of the reforms we're looking at today um, don't require agreement with other countries. They're about making our own system more effective. Um, for example, the people smugglers who are putting lives at risk so callously, we're going to increase the maximum penalty to life imprisonment um, because we're determined that uh, you know, innocent people's lives should not be put at risk. At the same right. time, where people... So have you, yeah, go on. It, we, the Home Secretary said today that the EU countries had a moral duty to, uh, return, to help return failed asylum seekers. But I just wonder, given we're criticised for not pulling our weight, Germany, for example, has taken more than half a million Syrians displaced, and we've only taken 20,000 under the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme. So are we any, in any position to sort of lecture the rest of the EU about moral duty? Well, first of all, when it comes to, for example, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, uh, we, have, we have taken and we have more unaccompanied asylum-seeking children than any other European country, including countries like Greece, who obviously are right on, the, uh, right on Europe's border. In terms of resettlement, I think you've got to distinguish between people who come into Europe um, essentially illegally which is the half million you're referring to, versus people who come in on safe and legal routes like the resettlement scheme, where we go to Syria or go to refugee camps near Syria and, and, and find uh, you know, women and children and families who need protection and we bring them directly to the UK. And our resettlement programme over the last five years has been bigger than any other country's resettlement programme in Europe. So that's what we mean by, by doing it the right way, safe and legal routes. People travelling illegally in the hands of people smugglers is not what we should be you know, um, pointing to or seeking to emulate. We should be stopping the people smugglers okay. and instead focusing on those safe and legal routes. That's our, that's our approach. Chris Phil, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.